Right, welcome to uh, week, uh, week 10. Uh, this is a Zoom session. Um, and I had a couple of audio problems this morning on uh, Zoom. So um, what I'm going to do is just make a video recording and post it in, in lieu of the uh, discussion we had on Zoom. Um, we had some great input too from some of the people who uh, um, attended live. Um, Kaylee in particular, Fiona, some great. Um, Julia, um, thank you all for your comments. And hopefully we'll, um, we'll do them justice in this uh, remake of the classic all right, so we've begun by talking about the role of the teacher. Um, now, we're pointing here to the notion, really, of assessment task two, um, and the incorporation of technology. So, so what does a teacher actually try to do with technology? Now, a tr teacher doesn't try to mystify, you know, this is not silicon snake oil, snake oil. We don't really want to blow the students away with technology, nor can we, um, because if you're teaching in Education Queensland, you'll find out that most um, um, software, most, most freeware, um, is actually not permitted. It's blocked by Education Queensland. So even though the examples we saw on the Moodle this week um, rated at HD, um, and they're exemplars of practice in relation to digital tasks too, um, you know, just be cautious. Weebly is blocked by Education Queensland. You know, you actually have to get permission from high levels to actually use Weebly with your students. So what we imagine is possible using ICTs um, in reality becomes significantly reduced. So we've got to find a more workable model for technology in our classroom. Some of the private schools, no problems at all. They have op open forum, op open slather um, use of, of technology. Um, Education Queensland, um, for instance, even the laptops at issues to senior students are generally locked down and, and, and many, many facets blocked. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a limited version of ICTs that we can implement, but we can still make them sexy and we can still make them very, very productive. So the teacher is got the burden of doing that. They've got to shape the conditions in which students become engaged in their own learning. Technology is great. Okay, we can use technology to explore and discover, create knowledge, um, all of these really, really important things. Um, discovery learning. We can send them home. Knowledge creation, knowledge sharing. We can set up collaborations. Contributions, the contributing student model, where students begin, for instance, as consumers of our teaching you know, we, we offer them content and they pick through it and graze through it like chickens. And ultimately they become producers of their own learning. And this is what we assess them on. And you know, science, the ACS, is all about authenticity. How can we take you know, complex representations and models and make them authentically real to our learners? And of course this brings about you know, topic number two because it's got the digital component in this assessment. You're, you're looking at moving away from simple uh, direct teaching okay and instruction and you're moving much more towards activities that are mediated um, by, by technology where students can use that technology to become co-designers for themselves and for others so Russell Stannard I'm not going to talk too much about uh, uh, this from this point I'm just going to let Russell Stannard talk and um, I'll just change my pointer and We'll get Russell producing talking. flipped classroom content. Now, despite the fact that the flipped classroom uh, would seem to be something that was invented uh, perhaps uh, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, I remember going out to America in 2009 and being involved in a flipped classroom uh, conference. In fact, the roots of it come from something called the inverted classroom. And in the inverted classroom was a very similar idea. That is the idea of the students preparing and doing work at home so that in the classroom the teacher could spend more time doing kind of group work and pair work and more activities that process the language. So in fact it's got its roots in something called the inverted classroom. But perhaps the reason why the flipped classroom has become well known is because of the affordances of technology. What's happened in the last 15-20 years particularly, though of course technology has been around for a long long time, but what's happened in the last 15-20 years has there's been a huge introduction with the advent of Web 2.0 and the possibilities of learning management systems, screen capture, putting video on the internet, etc. Lots of different ways now that technology can be incorporated into teaching and learning. So it's the combination of these two things together that have created a scenario where the flipped classroom is a possibility. Right, so the flipped past classroom is a possibility. So what we're doing is we are pulling stuff out of the classroom and we are putting it elsewhere. 
Okay, it can be the library, it can be home, it can be anywhere, but we're embedding it in technology so that we're stripping the classroom, using technology as our stripping device, and we're creating more space for teaching and learning. So this assessment task is not focusing on technology. It's focusing on the interplay between technology and face-to-face -face teaching. How does one support the other? Russell Stannard continues. This is a pretty common definition that you will see that's pretty good, but it's quite interesting to think that in a way this is beginning to evolve and change, and later on I will talk about this. But what we're talking about is we define the flipped classroom as an educational technique. That's a really important word, educational technique. It's not a methodology, it's, it's a technique. Uh, it's a way of organising learning. It's a form of blended learning. That's really important. And it has two parts. The interactive group learning activities in the classroom. This is really true. What we're trying to do is make the classroom time more interactive, more group work, more pair work, more working on tasks, more using the knowledge that the students have, have picked up, have learned, have absorbed. And then the second part is, well, the low, what we call the lower order thinking skills, going home, learning the basics around a particular subject so that in the class you can begin to process that language and to be able to actually, or process those ideas, whatever the topic has to be, and to actually use it and to function with it and work with it and link it to other things that you know. So there's got two parts to it. Now, one of the interesting things is that this is beginning to change. In other words, yes, the students go home, yes, they go online, they watch videos, etc., but we can actually make that part of the learning also more group work based and we'll all right so we're starting to see students subverting the paradigm this isn't this what kids do you know they subvert the paradigm and and even though as teachers initially technology began I mean I remember when I, I began teaching um, technology was typing okay that was the typing class but students begin to, to subvert you know we then use you know the web as a, a research tool um, but now, of course, we've got the collaborative components to that, social media, we've got all of the things that kids do. So they're actually learning to use these technologies and adapt them, which brings us on to Bloom and digital cards. And Russell's going to talk here about Bloom's taxonomy. And our digital cards, try to think of them as, as you know, we're using a digital card here to work at certain levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Have a think about it. I'll talk a little bit. When we look at the flipped classroom, we often talk about Bloom's taxonomy, and I must admit I'm a big fan of Bloom's taxonomy. The idea behind Bloom's taxonomy is that often when we learn something, we first of all learn the basic concepts. So let's say it was a history. We would learn the basic concepts of, say, perhaps the Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire. But then later we might then begin to apply that knowledge. We might compare, for example, the fall of the Roman Empire with the fall of the British Empire, or with the fall of the Soviet Union. We might look at, see if there are any parallels between the two. We begin to actually use that knowledge and link it with other knowledge. We begin to apply and analyse it and understand it better. So we move from sort of lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills. Now this is really interesting here because I'll just add a bit. When we use the technology, we can send students away to, you know, we can use technology resources, describe, list, identify, define, recall. We can get them to actually develop their knowledge, then to comprehend the links between that knowledge. So as a teacher here, we are, we are deconstructing. We're sort of saying to them, all right, this is what you think about the solar system. Well, here are some facts. Here is some evidence. Here is some knowledge paradigm shifting. Once they do that, they get to start to comprehend a little bit more about their learning about their concepts and once they've got that comprehension and knowledge they're then ready to start applying and here's where you come in as the teacher here's where constructivism is at its best when we look at application the ZPD we can start to say okay we know this we know this we are now starting to reconstruct by application to real-world scenarios models inquiry prediction hypothesis all of these different things that apply now I just want to focus on five key points that really emerge from the points that I've made so far in terms of the way that the learning is organised. Firstly, the flipped classroom is a form of blended learning. When we're talking about the flipped classroom, we're talking about a blend. That is a combination of face-to-face -face teaching and using technology outside of the classroom. So it's a blend. It's a particular way of organising that blend, but it's a blend. Secondly, 
it means that to a degree some of the teaching stuff is being moved out of the classroom and moved to home now what do I mean by teaching stuff well I call the teaching stuff when the teacher is basically passing knowledge to the students that might be the teacher standing at the front of the class and explaining something about the Roman Revolution or in a geography lesson talking about the formation of mountains or, or whatever topic you're looking at it could be language you could be looking at vocabulary and vocabulary explanations that teaching stuff try to take some of that teaching stuff out of the class and the students can go home and do that instead so instead of me standing at the front of the class talking about the fall of the Roman Revol uh, the Roman Empire I can get the students to go home and maybe watch a video or listen to a podcast or even read an article about that and then in the class we can perhaps do some more comparative work more project based work further investigation as I said students could then kind of move on to sort of more group based pair work activities where they're beginning to actually use that knowledge so we free up some of the class time which previously we were using for teaching and we use it more for group based work project work etc now it's a technique it's a technique it's not an approach to every single class it's not appropriate in every single context it works particularly well in some contexts. I found myself using it at certain points when it's worked really well when it seems to work really well so it's not something that you're always going to do and there are lots of reasons why you might not do it always one are the materials available for the students to do the learning at home two is the concept the type of concept that's easy to transfer to the students so some concepts are quite complex and need more support from the teacher so it does depend to a large degree also on the context the material etc now one of the last points I want to make, and this is really in interesting and an important point, is the, the role of the student. The student's role sort of changes because the student now has to prepare for the lesson. So in a way we could argue that we're going to obviously put more responsibility on the students in terms of their own learning. And a lot of people say, ah, oh, this ends up being a lot more work for the students. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, they, they could go home and watch a three or four minute video about the Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire and then do a simple quiz or prepare a few slides so that they can do their own presentation in the classroom. It doesn't have to mean that there is a lot more work for the student to do at home. It's simply homework, but it's homework of a different nature. Now really, have a close listen to that. You know, This is a video, so you can just slide back your video slide and listen to it again if you want. Um, this is really the guts of assessment task number two. Um, it's all about how you use it, your pedagogy. So think closely about what you're going to do. It's not a technique for every lesson. Some concepts are going to need you as a teacher at the front of the classroom, the sage on the stage. Other concepts like yeah, are going to lend themselves very, very well to this kind of approach. So part of the success of assessment task two is going to be making sure that your topic fits the approach where you're embedding it in technology. And also that it's explicit that when students take the material home that they are actually expert enough to be able to use it, that the resources are available to them, not only the, the, the material and, and digital resources but also the, the capital resources, the cultural capital, that they actually have what it takes, they have the right stuff to actually complete these tasks. So they're big pedagogical questions for a teacher. Digital affordances, okay, technology does make a lot possible. Really the fact that technology and technology in terms of digital technology and the possibilities of things from the introduction of Web 2.0 etc that have really allowed for this um, move from what I called the inverted classroom to what we perhaps talk about now in the flipped classroom and it's worth thinking about it because see what you've got now are many many different resources that are available to students that they can, we can either create as teachers or we can access them now more and more teachers are learning to access content that's been built by other people or created by other people and left on the internet 
So there's podcasts and videos and screencasts and quizzes and all sorts of things. So it doesn't necessarily mean to say that the teacher has to make all this learning content because much of it is already on the internet and available for people. And it also means that the teacher has to think very carefully about well, what types of activities are they going to do in the classroom because now it's going to be more around tasks and problem solving and activating that knowledge that the students have developed at home. So it requires new skills from the teacher. Teachers need to be good at finding content that they're going to share with the students for them to access at home and in some cases they're need, going to need to also make content and students teachers are going to also need to think about how they devise activities in the classroom and these are big challenges they're not uh, easy challenges for many teachers to take on really the fact all right now I'm just going to pause it there for a moment um, there again is some really good ammunition for assessment task number two okay and, and the key focus of this task is how does the technology support what you do inside the classroom so let's not put technology above everything else okay that's foolishness that's what we call toolishness and it's foolishness let's put technology in the context of your class okay now a little example I gave this week was um, evidence of the Big Bang now this is not my unit of study at all it's just something I plucked and, and I mean the reason why I'm using it is because it's relevant to Earth and, and space science um, and it's also um, gives you an example of, of, of how to convert um, this material in, into um, a learning sequence because assessment task 2 is essentially a learning sequence it's a mini unit and it's a unit that has obviously had something go before it and it's going to have something that comes after it so when you talk about the orientation to this unit you know, you're going to have to mention in, in, in your sequence what's gone before, what the entry level is. And so, I mean, I started this one off with a word search. And the word search really um, deals with this whole notion of the Big Bang Theory, what are the key words and concepts. And again, you can see that operating at the very low level of knowledge in Bloom. Okay, here are the hangs, here, here are the hooks, and here's where students will start to arrange these hooks into some sort of knowledge structure. The key words, CMBR, Redshift, Nobel Prize and Steady State. Now these are all captured in a beautiful little one-page article um, about two scientists, two university students, who were awarded the 1960 Nobel Prize for actually discovering redshift. And redshift, of course, is evidence of radiation, and radiation, of course, is evidence of the Big Bang Theory. So this was a significant Nobel Prize award, one of the, the, you know, the most significant discoveries, because up till then we had a theory of steady state that the, you know, the universe came, emerged as a result of steady, steady state evolution and, and growth. Um, we now know that's not true at all. We you know, for instance, that there's a, you know, a 1,000th degree uh, difference between red spots, yellow spots, and blue spots. And we also know with radiation cameras, we can actually um, we can pick that up. And the blue spots, of course, are the cooler spots. And what this gives us is a motion chain, what we call redshift. Redshift are the hot spots. So the universe is still expanding. There are some bits of it that we can see are visibly hotter than others. It is exponentially expanding, and those, you know, that those blue and, and yellow bits are bits that are, are progressively cooling. So we're starting to see evidence, and this is why the Big Bang Theory has grown in such um, um, strength. Um, again, you know, the splitting of the first atom, um, and, and the explosion, the explosion of the first atom, its ripple effect, it's still exploding, the incredible heat. And of course, the gases you know formed less than one second after the initial explosion, and of course have continued to expand and grow. And hence, we get the red shift, the red points, of course, representing movement. So we can see the universe is constantly evolving. So that's really heady stuff. I mean, how are you going to break that down for kids? You know, challenging. So you're going to have your your scaffold here. You want all kids to understand something. Come away from this unit, okay? The two main pieces of evidence for the Big Bang theory. That is. You know, if they had to have an argument in the playground, how could they support the Big Bang Theory? Most kids, you want them to explain some of the science behind it. You know, radiation and redshift. What are they? How do they happen? How do they work? What do they mean? And some students are actually going to be able to go one level further and actually evaluate the Big Bang Theory of the universe. Compare it, for instance, to the steady state system. Compare it to, for instance, creation. Compare it to the Inca, to the Aztecs. Um, to the Egyptians, you know, the god Ra, um, Contiki from the Incas, um, the Christian Judea, you know, Old Testament, Genesis, and the word was God and, and, you know, the world was built in seven days and everything happened on one day and nothing on another day and that's all that happened and, you know, these are our, our evolutionary theories. 
Now, this week I actually point to a, a little example um, where I then take a lesson sequence. And this is not my sequence, so you know there's a lot of faults with this, obviously. Um, but again, what I've created here is a blog spot. And a box blog spot is a lot like Wiki. And all I've done is just basically embedded a document in there. And I, for instance, would hyperlink from this to different parts within my own, own blog. And that would give you examples of the resources I intended to use, um, the worksheets I intended to use, etc., etc., etc. So um, when submitting this piece, um, obviously I would submit a copy of it along with my assignment, and those hyperlinks would then actually link directly to my blog or to my wiki. Now, if you're going to do that, make sure that your wiki or blog has public access because there's no point locking your uh, assessment away because nobody will ever get to it and nobody will be able to grade it. So if you're going to use a blog and a wiki, just ensure that it's in the public domain. But there's a little example of just posting a sheet in there, hyperlinking from that sheet to different parts of the blog, and that actually sets up a really, really good example um, of how that task can be done and what a sequence of work might look like. So there are two ways basically to incorporate technology into this assessment item. You can build your own digital repository and the example I just showed you was you know, a very simple one that I was using for another subject. Simply put up a sheet and that sheet was hyperlinked to different resources. So again my lesson sequence becomes operative and dynamic. I would send my students to that blog spot and my students would access that blog spot and you know again I can make it private so that they can um, just use a password or a code word, get in there and off they go. They can be independent at home or at work or at school. Okay, You can use Weebly. Some of you are using Weebly, but bear in mind some of these technologies are actually blocked by Education Queensland. So even though they'll work for this assignment, out there in the real world it's going to create other problems. And you can just create a Word document with hyperlinks. Okay, for instance, other resources. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen TED Ed. I, um, I promoted it this morning in, uh, in the Zoom session, and um, people seem to really like um, the potential from TED Ed. And I'll just explain a little bit about it. Um, TED Ed is a, um, it's a share resource done by teachers, and it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of what they call lessons, but they're more than lessons. They're what Russell Stennett would call flipped classrooms. So in other words, any video on YouTube okay, can be linked to. And you can make your own video and post it, which in this case um, Tom Winnity, a PhD um, um, scientist, has done. And the nice thing about this is, have a look at how many views. You can tell usually how good they are by the number of views. You can moderate or customise this lesson for your own purposes based on this one. Um, and it's you know really really easy to do. You can watch the lesson. It's broken down, okay, in, into various pedagogical steps. So you can send your students home. Okay, task is to watch the lesson and then get into the think activities. So when you look at the think, for instance, we've got five multiple choice and three short answer questions. We go to the think. After the video, the students are now starting to build their knowledge. Okay. Bloom's busily at work here. Knowledge and comprehension. We're starting to do that important reconstructive work. As you can see, the questions go on. Okay, how long after the Big Bang before protons and neutrons? Okay, microseconds, a few seconds. We know the answer is microseconds. Once you've done these questions and you've got some basic understanding going, you can see how this is working. Now, a teacher could stand at the front of the room and lecture this, or the students could actually do it themselves. Once they've done that, they can go to the Dig Deeper link. And the Dig Deeper link is a series of hyperlinked documents. And you can see, for instance, there are other videos. Okay, A recipe for making your own universe. Some fantastic stuff. More videos. Okay, Stuff in virtual laboratories. Simulated galaxy. Okay, All kinds of different things in here. And extension activities. So as a teacher, you may be able to use some of this, for instance, for research and extension purposes. Again, the next level, you get into discussion. There is a guided discussion where we've got people who are studying this, uh, this topic or this issue um, and they're in there having discussions. And you can see, for instance, you can link your students um, to some of those points. Or you can ignore it altogether or you can start your own discussion where you can be the guide and get students to answer a series of questions. 
or explore a series of questions um, through that process of inquiry. So that's TED-Ed. It's a wonderful resource. Don't, don't forget about it. It can save you an awful lot of time. Now, in this week's module, um, I went through and actually said, OK, once you use technology, you, you've then got to make most of the space that the time technology gives you. Um, so if students are doing some of that knowledge and comprehension work at home, then that's giving you more time in the classroom. You know, the sage has gone from the stage. It's now in the computer. You're the meddler in the middle. You're the guide by the side for those students who are struggling. A jigsaw task. Break the room into different groups. Give each person in the group a role. An analyst, someone to analyse the information. Work out the concepts. A scribe, someone to record. A reporter, someone who's going to check back with the group and then report to the, the class at large. A noise monitor, not someone to keep the noise down, but someone to make sure the noise is productive. And a timekeeper, someone to keep the group, a facilitator, someone to keep the group on task. So give them all a role so that everybody's valued and everybody's doing something and everybody's busy. Once you've done that, give them tasks and questions. I mean, I would break this one up and I'd give them all question number one first, or give them one question each. Then I'd say once they've reported back on their question, they then go away and they explore what the other groups have said, um, and they find out for themselves, using the, the source information, what the correct answers were. Really important at that point is that you, you have some sort of spotlight focus when you bring the groups back together so that you, again, here you are, you've deconstructed their knowledge, you've built their comprehension. You're now starting to reconstruct it. We're starting to apply it, that application stage of Bloom. We're starting to apply it back to the world and back to theory. So we need a way of doing that, and Spotlight is a good way to do it. Put a spotlight on, on, on groups and people and questions. The empty chair is another good way of doing it. Okay? And the fact that your groups all had a reporter, they can report back. So you've got your information here, you've got your answers ready. So that that, that notion of, of reinforcing knowledge construction is happening on the spot every time. You know, anyone who's trained a dog, you know that the, the key is reward, but the reward has got to be connected to behaviour. Now, the same with students. The learning behaviour has got to be connected with the reward. So again, once a question's answered, put up the solution. Question's been answered, put up the solution. Let them bathe, let them bask in their glory. Okay? And, and let them also connect to the knowledge and reconstruct. Probe, ask questions puzzle. In the module I presented too, um, the culminating task was building a model of the universe. I mean, this has been a popular one with some students, um, and certainly coming through some of the examples of assessment task two I've seen, um, is building a model of the universe. A couple of steps on how to do that. I mean, obviously you take them from the, the point of ignorance, you know, where you're actually working with their knowledge. And I, I don't mean ignorance as in rudeness. I mean, okay, it's naivety. And students are naive. I mean, they've seen a lot, they've heard a lot, they believe a lot, and they'll believe anything, and they're very fluid. Our aim is to actually give them knowledge and comprehension, so we've got to nail that down. So define your key terms and get them busy. How do scientists use models? Now, we're not talking about the universe yet. Okay, the universe, okay, what is it? It's a representation. What is it really? Well, it's gas, it's minerals, it's all the physical attributes we can talk about. So how do scientists use models? Well, they've built a model of the, the universe. And why? To explain and predict what our future might be. We can look at error and misrepresentation when students are building models. And here we can compare some theories. For instance, the Incas, uh, the Judeo-Christian model, um, the steady state model. And we can compare that, for instance, to the Big Bang. And we can look at error and misconception, how science learns from itself. We then get down to modelling. Give them 30 minutes to build a model of the solar system. Give them all different materials, some fruit. Give others clay, give others marbles. A whole range of stuff you can do, a range of solutions down here and suggestions. But the most important thing, okay, is here. When you do this task, ensure that you have a worksheet. Because students can get lost. You know, that the learning can leave the body and float around the room. It become amorphous, it become almost a, an spiritual thing. What you've now got to do is bring it back down to application. And so, and again, you know, and we're doing that heady group work, that stuff there that teachers do. What are the features? What things does your model misrepresent? Okay, what errors do you think you might have in it? Um, what have you left out? What haven't you addressed? And what questions came up for you? Our puzzle questions. 
write those down or I want all of you to write your puzzle question on a yellow stick it. I want you to go to the wonder wall and stick it there. Okay? That becomes your next level of inquiry. We looked this week also at plotting interstellar distances, and you can see each of the planets listed here and the toilet roll exercise. Predictions. Hypotheses. Okay, all inquiry based stuff. Another good question is to turn the oval into, for instance, um, the universe or, or the solar system. And for each student um, in their groups to actually go and plot where they think um, the distance of the planets represents. So get them to hypothesize. The next task, of course, is get them to investigate and then, using technology, possibly digital cameras, um, actually get them to map and chart and capture their, um, their science. Assessment task two, um, it just to remind you again that this is very much about scaffolding an independent learning experience. So you're flipping your classroom. As Russell says, you're pulling the teacher out, putting the technology in. You're using that technology primarily for lower end knowledge comprehension application tools. Once students have completed those lower end tools, you bring them together in a group and you work your magic as a teacher. Now it's for small groups, so your task independent work as small groups, so the groups obviously are going to need to have some sort of structure, and that's why I threw that jigsaw task in there as an example. It's got to be from two strands, biological and earth and space, okay, and of course um, it's got an academic component. Part A is your, your review of the literature and, and your statement of pedagogies. Um, make sure that's clear for us. Now a key quest point to make there is you're in charge. If you do this ass assessment task and you do it well, you can't really fail. Because in part A, you're telling us what you're going to do, and in part B, you're doing it. So everything you say in part A, we will hold you accountable for. So you'll have your literature review, you'll have your introduction, where you'll talk about your two pedagogies, you'll give your rationale for those pedagogies, you'll list your age groups, and, and you'll be able to um, identify your strands and substrands. Then you get into the body. Half the body will be dealing with pedagogy one, the other half pedagogy two. You'll be giving the literature frame, and please don't stick to Gregson. Gregson represents intellectual laziness. If you don't go beyond Gregson, you're not doing a literature review. Just because Gregson said it doesn't make it true. Okay, go beyond Gregson. Gregson lists all of his sources. Look up a few of those. Okay, explore them. So. Part B, in, in your, your body, you've got your two pedagogies. You will be going through justifying those and pointing to the types of, of strategies that you'll be using in your digital card. You can even be explicit to say refer to digital card phase one, phase two or phase three. Okay, It's really important that in, in that section that you tell us what you're going to tell us. And that then in your conclusion to part A, you simply say, all right, this, this project, this assignment, this paper is going to present two digital cards, one specifically designed for this, one specifically designed for this. In each of these cards, I will cite my pedagogical moves, I will cite the use of ICTs, and I will cite the lesson sequence. Okay, really important you do that. Part B, as you can see, is the two digital cards. We had some discussion. Um, Fiona mentioned this morning that um, she believes that uh, early childhood teachers can now teach up to year six um, in, in, uh, in Education Queensland classrooms. That could quite be the possibility because um, the Queensland College of Teachers has also recently increased um, the, the pre-entry requirements um, for early childhood teachers so that, for instance, maths component has doubled, etc., etc. So um, whereas early childhood teachers t weren't used to be required to do double level maths, um, they are now, so that obviously opens up more teaching opportunities to them because they're entering more of the traditional realm of the primary school. So you'll see some shifts there, but you've got one card for use in, in the, the prep to year three um, groups for primary and the upper primary, and the other course for the zero to five for early childhood or year seven to nine, depending on, on um, uh, where you sit. Now, um, clearly the early childhood people won't be doing seven to nine primary. You'll be doing um, uh, foundation to, to six, somewhere in there. Um, we had a really good discussion this morning, lots of good questions came out. Um, I was really pleased that people are confident with this task. 
it's a more structured task than assessment task one. Um, and I think some people were ex ex you know, ex expressing confidence around that, that they felt more at home with this task. It's slightly more traditional than the Peshakusha. So hopefully that comes through in the work you do. But bear in mind, I'll say one more time, um, it's really important that in your assessment task that you set the scene, that you throw the furniture around. Okay, What you tell us in part A is what we look for in part B. And the more explicitly you tell us in part A and why, the easier it makes for us to mark, make, mark part B. So if you're vague in part A and I'm drifting around part B, wondering what's going on, then chances are that it's, it's going to impact on your result. Whereas in part A, if you tell me ex clearly and explicitly what you're doing, and in part B, the evidence is laid out for me in two digital cards that I can't miss it, okay, the connections are there, the rationale is there, then obviously you're going to enjoy my joy um, in having met that criteria in the, in the level you have. I'll refer you again to the New Zealand games, um, particularly the early childhood people. Um, the FET stuff too has also got some good early childhood. You have to register with FET, it is free, but you do have to register. Um, and the kids, kids, uh, science kids in New Zealand, their curriculum models very much ours. So, you know, it's very, very similar sort of curriculum. My caution again with Gregson, don't use Gregson as your only literature source. If you do, you're not going to score well on that criteria, I'll tell you now. Gregson is a generic textbook. They do give a good covery of the relevant literature, but you know, bear in mind there's a whole lot of information pertaining uh, to, to, to the, uh, the pedagogies you're going to use, the narrative, the modelling, the, the POE, the 5Es, um, all of these, the simulation stuff, you know, all of these inquiry-based practices, there's a lot of uh, uh, stuff geared around that. Um, so please don't just resort to Gregson. Go a little bit beyond and you know, shackle, you know, shake away that, that intellectual laziness that um, we can sometimes fall into. Challenge yourself. All right, thank you all. Um, I'll post this again. Please get the Q&A buzzing. Um, you really need to. And next week I'll put up the last online lecture for the, the term. Um, where we look at earth sciences and um, we'll cover some of the issues um, there. Alright, take care everyone and speak soon.